Good. Uh, <coughs> Actually, I, I, I've changed the title. Uh, <coughs> now the title is the same as um, the title of our uh, forthcoming book, the book I'm, I've been writing with Julia Savulescu. And the, the talk I'm going to give is a sort of, um, well, it's a very short book, but uh, it's not so short you can make, uh, so you can summarize it in 25 minutes. But I'll be giving, I'll be giving a sort of the backbone of, of the book, I think. <coughs> so the book is about the need for moral enhancement. And... and uh, is by me and, and Julian Savulescu, although his, his name doesn't appear on this slide. Now, the first point, I, I've got four main points I want to make. The first point is that it's easier for us to harm each other than it is to, to benefit each other. To give an everyday illustration, most of you probably have access to a car and live in a densely populated area. I mean judging by the, the taxi drive to <laughs> this place. I mean, quite a few, uh, I realize quite a few people in, in Belgrade eh, mm. have cars, and it's, it's rather densely popular. Now, <coughs> by going for a drive, you can easily kill dozens of people by just plowing into to, to a crowd. But it will be very hard for you uh, to save the life of as many people. That would require... <coughs> that you are in a situation in which uh, there is a threat to people's lives and you have the capacity to, uh, <coughs> to avert that threat. You might be sitting next to a crazy driver or something, you prevent him from plowing into a crowd. But, I mean, you have to be in, in certain circumstances, whereas you could easily put yourself in a cir circumstance where you could kill a lot of people. Uh, there are actually two... Uh, aspects of this uh, <coughs> easiness to, to harm. The first is, is what I've been talking about, that the magnitude of the harm caused can, can be greater than the magnitude of the benefits provided that we can kill more individuals than we can save the lives of. There's another aspect, aspect of this, which are <coughs> there are normally many more ways of causing harm of a given magnitude than of benefiting to the same degrees. More ways for, of, of disturbing a well-functioning uh, system, like a, bi a biological organism, than of improving it to the same extent. I mean, because its functioning sort of depends on quite a lot of uh, uh, <coughs> interconnection with quite a lot of, of, of various factors. And, and if we disturb or remove one of those factors, we will uh, damage uh, the, the working of this system. Whereas in order to improve on its function, we will have to find something which fits in, to, uh, uh, <coughs> in this whole integrated structure, which is a much more difficult thing. Because there are many more ways of, of <coughs> uh, uh, causing an, uh, harm to an, to an organism, making it dam do, do, do damage to it. It's also the case that most things that happen to, to uh, uh, a well-functioning organism uh, makes it perform less good. And that, this is what's known as entropy. In the course of time, sort of things fall apart, function le less well, and so on. Now, even if it had been uh, <coughs> as easy, contrary to what I've argued, it had been as easy to, 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 save, a life as to, to save lives as to kill, it would still not follow that it would be as easy to benefit as to harm. <coughs> this is, suppose that a life is overall good, overall better than non-existence. Now, if we were to save somebody whose life is like that, we can't claim uh, credit for, for all the good that this individual gets in, in the future, because that will be dependent on quite a lot of things happening in the future. But if we kill that person or organism, we prevent all this good 
that will uh, that that th this individual would have had had he or she gone on living. So and the assumption that life is overall for the better, uh, our capacity to harm will be greater than our capacity to, be, to, to benefit, even if it had been as simple to save a life as to kill. Uh, of course, some people are pessimists, like uh, Arthur Schopenhauer and David Benetton and, and so on. And claiming that life is overall for the worse, life is suffering. So maybe, as Buddhism, you believe the same. Uh, now, if that had been the case, it would have been easier to 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 benefit people because if you if you kill them, you would sort of prevent all uh, the suffering that the future would otherwise have it, have in store for them. But I shall proceed on the assumption that I think most of us take that life is overall uh, good. Now, oh, sorry. What is that? I'm not very familiar with this, uh, okay, uh, computer. <coughs> so, that's the first point in my, <coughs> my talk. The second point is that as scientific technology increases our power of action, but as it increases our power uh, or, or powers of action, our capacity to harm has been magnified to the point at which we can ca cause ult what we call ultimate harm. That is to make worthwhile life forever impossible on this planet. Now, as scientific technology increases our pow powers of action, our power to do good increases. But, as I said, our power to, to harm is, is greater. So it, it keeps us lead, uh, uh, it's always ahead. And now the capacity has har to, to harm has reached a point where we can uh, cause ultimate harm. That is, we can make uh, life, uh, worthwhile life forever impossible in this plan. Notice that this is an act of this kind prevents quite a lot of goodness. Because if it hadn't been for this act, life could have gone on. People could have, people and other animals couldn't have gone on living, having worthwhile lives on this planet for thousands of years, perhaps. But if we do this act, we prevent all that. So uh, the instrumental badness of, of, of such an act of destroying worthwhile life on this planet forever is tremendous. I mean, it's impossible to benefit to the same extent. <coughs> so. I mean, there are various ways uh, of uh, causing ultimate harm. Uh, there are weapons of mass destruction. The most familiar ones are nuclear weapons, uh, which have been around us since, well, Second World War, 1950s. It was, it was <coughs> people feared it, and there was a phobia about it uh, in, in, in the 50s about it nuclear weapons. It's quite difficult to fabricate nuclear weapons, but uh, perhaps in the very near future it would be possible even for a terrorist group to, uh, uh, to fabricate nuclear uh, weapons out of uh, fissile material afloat, drifting around from the ex-former uh, Soviet Union, for instance, or, or whatever. Another kind of weapons of mass destruction uh, are biological weapons. Um, they're far easier to fabricate than uh, nuclear we weapons. Indeed, a single individual could do so. Uh, for instance, some scientists in Australia inadvertently produced a strain of mousepox that was lethal, lethal in 100% of, of uh, mice in, in the mice population they, in they examined. This result was published on the internet. Uh, if terrorists could get hold of information like that, they would be able to uh, genetically modify smallpox to make it lethal uh, in 
close to 100% rather than 30% as it is now, and make it resistance to current vaccines. They could then fly around and, and, and dis distribute it in, in, in uh, <coughs> airport terminals, underground stations, and, and so on. And it will infect thousands of people uh, because the incubation of time it, of smallpox is quite uh, is one to two weeks. It would have spread. They would. These people would spread it to other people and so on, and it would have a massive spreading before it was even discovered. So I, I think uh, biological weapons of uh, mass destructions are, are worth taking seriously uh, as well. But there's a further threat to. Uh, <coughs> different way in which the scientific technology has sort of uh, produced uh, this threat to our survival. This is that it has produced an explosion of the human population in its colonization of the whole planet by giving humanity uh, the means to an extensive uh, use of natural resources. The human population, as you know, is almost 7 billion, and it's expected to grow to 9 billion or by 2050, and perhaps to 10 billion by the end of the uh, century. Population growth is bad enough, but population growth will be published, uh, sorry, coupled with a sharp rise in consumption in various, in various populous countries like China, India, and Brazil. Now, the human impact or footprint on, on the earth, I mean, the resources we use and so on, and, and the waste pro product we uh, produce, is a function of three variables. It's the size of the human population, the average level of, of welfare, or the gross domestic product per capita, and the efficiency of technology in the sense that how much welfare it can sort of uh, generate out of a certain quantity of natural resources. Uh, since the 1970s, we've been overshooting the capacity of the Earth. That is, in a year, we've been producing, we've been using more of natural resources and producing more waste, waste than the Earth can uh, assimilate in a year. And now, that, and now, at the current time, overshoot day, that is the day when we sort of uh, have, have used the capacity, we, we, we overusing, start overusing the capacity of, of the world, has it has occurred since then 2008 or something like that in August or September. That means that we use 30% more uh, resources, 30% more of the Earth's capacity uh, than there is for us to take out. So there's an overuse, an accumulated overuse of, of uh, <coughs> the Earth. And of course, that can't go on. But it will be very hard to, uh, to rectify that problem just by making technology more efficient. It, for instance, uh, Clive Hamilton, in, in his book for Requiem for a Species, says that even if carbon units uh, per unit of gross domestic product uh, are cut by 90% to 2050, this won't be enough to, to prevent catastrophic climatic and environmental uh, uh, changes. Of course, such a, such a great increase of efficiency, technological efficiency, is hard to come by. But the pro there's a problem, because whenever human beings so far have been able to sort of use technology more efficient, they tend to consume more as well. So, so there's no sort of su surplus which isn't used. Uh, and it's likely that that will go on happening because the huge global inequality. Consider the two countries 
which, emose, which emit most carbon dioxide in the world, China and, and the United States. The population of China is roughly four times as large as the population of the United States. But the per capita emission of the United States is roughly five times as high uh, as it is in, in China. Moreover, since 1850, uh, the US has been responsible for 29% of the greenhouse ga gases put in the atmosphere, whereas uh, China has been responsible only for 8%. In view of this historical record, um, China could claim to have a right to uh, at least a per capita uh, <coughs> to, to a per capita uh, uh, emission rate of emission, which is at least as high as the United States, uh, at least sort of five times higher. But of course, that would be disastrous for, for, for the climate if, if China were to, to increase its level to that amount. Rather, equality has to be. Uh, 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 achieved by reducing the US level by 80% down to the current level of, of China. But of course that would be very difficult, if not impossible, to, to uh, it would be politically impossible, presumably, in, in the United States. And it will also be difficult to prevent China from not increasing the per capita uh, emissions further. So, but the situation is that the astonishing progress of scientific technology hasn't produced the bright hopes, uh, the bright future that w we might have expected it to, to produce. Quite the contrary, the future of huma humankind now looks darker than ever. The prominent uh, British scientist Martin Rees estimates, uh, quote, that the odds are no better than 50-50 that our present civilization on Earth will survive to the end of the present century. Such an estimate would have been wildly implausible before humanity acquired uh, the capacity to produce ultimate harm, when only things like supervolcanoes or hits by massive asteroids could uh, cause ultimate harm to us because those events occur only once in million ye millions of years or, or once in hundreds <coughs> of thousands of years. Uh, so it seems indisputable that the contemporary scientific technology has markedly increased the, the risk of worldwide cat catastrophe. Catastrophe, even if Reese's estimate of the risk might be somewhat uh, exaggerated. You can't sort of put numbers on risk like that. So we sort of, we in a dilemma. On the one hand, we need a very advanced technology, even more advanced technology than we have now, in order to support a huge and growing population of the, of the Earth in a sustainable way. On the other hand, advanced scientific technology uh, comes with a horrifying risk because, as I said, it's easier to harm than to benefit. So if we have a great capacity to do good, it will be accompanied by a, a tremendous risk of uh, ultimate harm. Now, what is the, <coughs> the reason for us being in, 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 in this dilemma? Well, <coughs> it seems clear that the reason must be that we're not capable of handling this powerful scientific te technology in a morally responsible way. Technology has progressed so quickly that there's now a huge mismatch between our technological and moral capacity. It's reasonable to hypothesize that our moral uh, psychology has been shaped to fit the society human beings have been living in for most of their uh, uh, one, for most of the hundred 
100,000 years they've existed and so on. That is small, close-knit societies with a primitive technology. And I should sort of detail, detail some aspects of our uh, 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 moral psychology and morality, which I think is sort of part of uh, what has made us fit for, for, for life in these uh, societies, which are radically different from contemporary societies, which are hugely populous and which, has this, uh, which have this very advanced technology. Uh, first, we have been in equipped with, this is a point where I actually, I'm sorry, the PowerPoint went out, but anyway. We've, we've been equipped with a bias towards the near future. Briefly and simply, this bias means that we are much more concerned about what happens to ourselves in the near future than in the more distant future. So if uh, a pain or some, something, something harmful is postponed, uh, we're relieved. If something pleasant we, we have, in, have in store is postponed, we're disappointed because we like the pleasant things to be close to us in time and, and the harmful things uh, uh, further away because we're less concerned about uh, the, the more remote future. Now this is partly rational because the, what, will happen, what could happen in the remote future is always less probable. But our bias towards the near is sort of steeper than this uh, uh, difference in, in probability. Uh, another thing is our limited or parochial altruism. I mean, many philosophers in, in the history of philosophy have claimed that we are uh, egoists. Uh, uh, one minute. Uh, sorry. Uh, <coughs> I have to be very quick. Uh, that we're egoists, um, we're concerned only about ourselves. But the truth is that uh, we are capable of some altruism, but it has a very close range. And we, 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 most, we, we care about our family, our, our, our children, our parents, our relatives, and so on. We also care about people we know uh, from personal experience, friends, and so on. But our altruism isn't extensive enough to uh, sort of extend all the way to, to people on, on, in, far, in far away countries and so on. Another thing is that our altruism is uh, limited in the way that we're not capable, we, we, we're capable of envisaging, uh, vividly imagine the suffering of a single individual in, in, in before our eyes, but not of hundreds uh, of, of uh, hundreds of, of sufferers and, and so on. So we, we're only capable of, of sort of uh, uh, feeling sympathy for, for, for uh, smaller populations, sm uh, few individuals, not great uh, populations in proportion to their number. Uh, another thing is that we, because it's easier to, to harm than to benefit, there is in our morality, uh, our morality is to the effect that it's, um, we consider it uh, too harder, <coughs> morally harder to justify doing harm, for instance killing than it is to failing to benefit. This is the act of mission doctrine, which says that it's, it's sort of more, and more difficult to... Uh... <laughs> That's a shame. I was... I was just about to, to sort of rounding up this thing. Um, so I've been talking about uh, act mission doctrine. Part of that is a conception of responsibility as causally based. 
This means uh, that our uh, responsibility, our sense of responsibility for that is proportional to our course of contribution, which means that if we're causing something uh, together with other people, which makes our own con course of contribution less, we feel less responsible for it. Now, it's quite easy to see how all these things uh, combine to create those moral problems we face today. Uh, uh, <coughs> because, <coughs> for instance, uh, the bias towards the near future, it, it makes us less concerned about the more distant future. But in order to do something about climate change, it's essential that we care about a more distant future. Because what we could do to the environment, to, to the climate today, the things cut down on carbon and so on, won't take effect until about 40 or 50 years from now. So we have to care, take, be concerned about a more distant future in order to, to, to uh, be concerned about. Also, uh, the fact that uh, our altruism is limited is significant in this context uh, because a lot of the climate changes we pr produce in, in, in the well of countries will uh, have bad effects for people in, in other countries. Uh, they would produce drought, droughts and desert, desertifica desertification in, in Africa and, and places like that. Also, the limited altruism is relevant to our uh, to the fact that we haven't have done so little to reduce uh, global inequality, reduce power, power poverty in 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 developing countries. So the. Uh, so. The very, the very last point. Sorry. <laughs> it is the last. It is the fourth. I said that the fourth one. Uh, so I, I, m m I think we need more enhancement to to co counteract those factors that I've been sort of uh, going through uh, in, in in a sketchy fact uh, uh, <coughs> manner and to prevent us from from. Uh, causing ultimate harm. So I stopped that. It was okay. the fun.